So I'm reading text from Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19. We're still talking about the Christian's spiritual life and complacency. The Christian's spiritual life and complacency. So verse 19 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Hori and went towards the hill country of Amorites through all the vast and dreadful desert that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of Amorite, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Verse 22. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. The idea seemed good to me. So I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Ascol and exploited it, taking with them some of the fruits of the land. They brought it down to us and reported, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. But you were unwilling to go up you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made us those hearts, they said. The people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large, with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you. As he did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes, and in the desert, there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carried his son all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey, the fire by night and in the cloud by day to reach our places for you to come and to show you the way we should go. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, not a man of this evil generation shall see the good land. Swore to give your forefathers, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, he will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on. Because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, You shall not enter it either. But your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him because he will lead Israel to inherit it. And the little ones that you say 
will be taken captive. Your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to you, them. I will give it to them, and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. Then you reply, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it's easy to go up into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up and fight because I will not be with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you, but you will not listen. You rebel against the Lord's command. And in your arrogance, you marched up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in those hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Halma. You came back and wept before the Lord, but he paid no attention to your weeping and turned a deaf ear to you. And so you stayed in Kadesh many days, all the time you spent there. This is the word of God. We thank God for this wonderful day. It's a topic we started some two weeks ago, the Christian's spiritual life and complacency. Uh, this gives the background to this particular thing that we are discussing. So, you heard the story, how Israel, being fed by God, turned against God. While Israel was so relaxed in the things in them and around them, they became complacent. And I, I define complacence in Chi as a hunte bone, a hunte bone. When you feel everything is good and well, then if you are not careful, complacence complacence sets in. You become indifferent to everything. The spirit of apathy possess you and nothing really matters to you. Those of you who are married, it does happen to married couples as well. Just as you think you have arrived, you are soaring in your businesses and the work you do and the, your vocation and professions. You are soaring so high in the friendships you make. Now you are a friend to some high-profile people. All of a sudden, you begin to think you have arrived. Your wife, your husband, is nothing more to you than somebody you are working with. It's a spirit of complacency. It is a spirit of apart. All of a sudden, your, wife, your children are in the universities and in high-learning institutions. You never thought that one day, one day, your child will be in the university because probably in our families, nobody had ever been to the university. You never thought. And all of a sudden, the Lord pushed your child into the university. And then complacency set in. You think now you have arrived. You have arrived. Oh, yes. You are also somebody. You are nobody. Without God, you are nobody. You heard what the Lord said to Israel. Because they were arrogant, the Lord failed to listen to them anymore. He will not give an ear to whatever thing they say because a hunter bunny sets it. And I said the other time that you were in a passenger house. You rented a single room. Husband, wife, and children, you were all boxed in a single room. Or hall and chamber. That's where you used to be. Every now and then fighting with the co-tenants. We supposed to, to, to sweep and never swept well. 
then it becomes a battle in that household. Who is supposed to have scrapped the bathroom? He did, but he never, she did, but never did it well. Then that also becomes another battle. He was supposed to have scrapped the gutters, the drainage in the house. The other person said he only never did it well. And so that also became a battle in that household. You were always fighting. Or somebody else in the household was always fighting with you. Then one day, God gave you a piece of land and gave you money to put up some humble building for yourself. Now you have moved into that building and you think you have arrived. Now complacency has set in. Oh, now I'm rubbing shoulders with landlords. I'm a part of the landlord association. I'm rubbing shoulders with them. If you are a landlord, you are not a landlord over God. God is not renting anything that belongs to you. God will never rent anything that belongs to us. Yes, because everything in us and around us is owned by him. So if you are a landlord, you are a landlord over people, but not God. So if you allow complacency to set in because the Lord has blessed you, you have yourself to be blamed. Now you have your master's degree. You think you have arrived. Now your children are getting married. You think you have arrived. Now you see the promotion. Have you seen the new car that you have? You think you have arrived. But I'm telling you, you have not arrived yet. You have not arrived yet. This is part of the process that will take you to your final destination in heaven. This is only part of the process. This is only part of it. Okay, this is only part of it. So don't be complacent. For you, your children listen to you. So you are okay. You think you are the best parent. You are not. It is the grace of God that has tolerated you. That person, the children are not listening to him or her. So you think the parents are so bad. They are not even spirit-filled. If they were, their children wouldn't behave the way they behave. No. That is only childish and immature way of thinking. Some have, some have worked very hard towards their children, bringing their children closer to God. And yet when their children grew up, they tend to their own ways. Just like Israel has done to God. So if your children are responding to your voice, it is because of God's grace and mercy. You have not arrived yet. Do not let complacency set in. You came from a village. When you came here, you didn't have a place to sleep. You were perching. Some of us were sleeping on somebody's veranda. That's where we used to sleep. But today, by the grace of God, you have money, you have rented a place for yourself. You have not arrived yet. You have not. You play the instrument so nice, so beautiful. You have the skill. You can play it well. You have not arrived yet. So don't let complacency set in. This is just the beginning of God's blessing. Just the beginning. I see myself as the beginning of the blessings of God over my life. That is how I see myself. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. I'm yet to see the end. By, by faith, I know the end will be beautiful than now. That is the way we should be seeing ourselves. Whatever thing the Lord has given to you is because of his grace and mercy. Don't let apathy set in. Or because the Lord is blessing your life. You know, you've been telling you that, oh, you are so beautiful, you are so beautiful. Even when two of you are walking, you, yourself, and your friend, your, your another girlfriend, are walking together. Sometimes you are singled out and you are told that you are so, you look so gorgeous. And they, the same will not be said of your friend. And now you have a solo head. You begin to think you are so beautiful. And so even you want your pastor to watch me, I will not worship you. I will not worship you. Because the beauty you have was given to you by God. At most, I will give you respect and I will honor you, but I will not worship you. So don't worship yourself because of your beauty. You have not arrived yet. This is by the grace of God that you look so gorgeous. If you have been to the hospitals, Gompanochi and elsewhere, 
you realize that be beauty doesn't count when you get sick. It doesn't count at all. So, don't let anything make you complacent. Don't let anything. Don't let anything. Let the Lord alone and his work. The understanding of how he works fill you to the brim. Complacency and you must you. And who tell one and you must you. And you know me. Complacency is a curse. So don't allow that. Don't permit it. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Christ. Because this is what Israel did. And they found themselves in trouble. I want to move from where I landed the other time to another point I read. I said, why is, the first point was, wise is the person who remembers God daily in times of both need and prosperity. Wise is the person who remembers God daily in times of prosperity and need. So whether you are in need or you have prospered, you still will remember God. If you are able to do this, you are a wise person. The second point is, wise is the person who remembers the job God calls him or her to do. Wise is the person who remembers the job God calls us to do. So if, if you remember what you have been called upon to do, you are a wise person. That's why the Bible says, wise is the person who wins souls to Christ. Wise is the person who remembers the job, the task, the purpose, the objective of your calling, the reason of, your, of you being called. If you can always remember why you have been called, why you have been singled out by God, why you have been, God has been so nice with you. If you can always remember that, then we are wise. If we have forgotten why we have been called, the reason for God sending his son Jesus to save us, if we have lost sight of that, then we are not being wise, but we are being something else. But for those who remember the purpose the job, a juma radia frail, the job, those who remember and live accordingly with that, you are a wise person. By abandoning God's purpose for your life, we also abandon His help. So if you throw away the task, the purpose for which God has called you, if you forget, then you should as well forget about the help God can offer to you. By conditioning God's purpose for your, your life, we also abandon his assistance. Some of us, we end up attaching condition to the very purpose God has called us. For example, he, he called you and equipped you with gifts and talent to be playing the drums, to be playing the drums in the house of God. And so, uh, you, 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 you are so talented in doing it. If you lose sight of it, that God gave this as a task, as the purpose for bringing you here, then you begin to attach condition. One of the condition, prevailing condition in our generation is that uh, if I will come here every Sunday to play this, then you have to give me allowance to do so. That is one of the conditions. If it is your profession to do that, fair enough. That is the work you are living on, okay? But if this is not your profession, for example, you are a student and God has given you this opportunity, and attaching condition to this will amount to the fact that you have forgotten why God called you. Your main work is there. This is just displaying the gift of God in you. So you couldn't attach strong condition to it. If the church decides to give you something for something, it is all right. Many years ago, when Michael was at College, he, the, one of the housemasters who is so close to us called 
and said that there's a Methodist church close by Brempe. And they want to employ Michael so that he went there to play organ for them on Sundays. At that time, they said they will give him 300 Ghana, 3 million cities. This is about three or four years ago. They will, they, about four years ago. They will give him three million cities a month. So that every Sunday he goes there to play. They call our attention. I discussed with my wife. And we felt that this is a young man. The father and mother take care of him. Ask Michael whether we've not been giving him food to eat. Ask him whether the pocket money he has, he worked and earned it. You go and ask him. We do that as parents, as you do for your children. We also do that. So we pay the fees. So why would he go and play and take three million cities as a condition? And I said, no. If you ever go and play, you will play for free. Otherwise, he spends his time to study and things like that. You know, these simple, simple conditions can actually derail you from receiving the gift the actual gift God want to give to you. So don't take lots of little things to exchange for bigger blessings the Lord has for you. Don't attach condition. Don't forget why the Lord has called you. Do not forget the job God calls you for. So people of God, it is important. People that had gone before us also received a certain kind of calling. They were called in various capacities. In different times, they were called to achieve different goals for God and for themselves. For instance, we cannot forget about Moses who was called by God and never even understood God. You know, the, pro the process leading Moses to liberate the people from Egypt was a tall journey. From the onset of his call, close to Mount Sinai, he objected. He argued with God. I don't even know how to. I'm, I, I, I'm a stamina. I can't even speak well. How do I go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, I cannot do this? Then in the end, he asked God, So you call me, so what is your name? God. When I go and the people ask me, which of the gods called me? What should I tell them? He said that when you go and they question about the God who could tell them that it is the God of their fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. God. So God I declared his identity to Moses so that Moses will be able to do it. The fact is that God has determined that the, the purpose for which he has called Moses will come to fruition. Whether Moses liked it or not, God wanted that to happen. So if you want my identity, this is my identity. Go and tell them. If you even want powers, I will give you a, a staff, Puma. And out of that staff, I will perform miracles. Okay, you are saying that you are stamina. You, you could not speak well. Let's, I will call your brother Aaron to come to be your linguist. So when God calls us, he gives us all the logistics, all the things we need. He makes them available, except that we sometimes have failed to see with our visible eyes. Sometimes we have failed to see. Yesterday, I was listening to, I think, the late Don Kicho. You've heard about him. I was listening to him, one of his um, presentations. And he was telling us that after all the things he did for God, he was there one day where God convicted him and said, why don't you design a Christian newspaper? A Christian newspaper. Just not political newspaper. Not social newspaper, but a Christian newspaper. And then he said to God, but how do I get money to do this? This is a big job. How do I do it? And he was always in battle with God how to do it because he didn't have money. And then he was walking somewhere, he saw a land at a prime area. And that land was sold over $1 billion. He didn't have money. He went to God in prayer. He said, you want me to establish it? There were the money, I want 
the, 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 the office to be somewhere located at the center, the prime area of the city. So, so how do I raise this money? He said, to cut a long story short, before he realized, somebody called him and said, I listened to some of the things you said, and I'm so blessed. And I wish to do something for you. And I've overheard that that expensive land there, you, 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 you needed it. He said, yes, I needed it. He says, I've purchased that land for you. I've purchased it for you. Take that land. And people raised money within a short time. He bought all the machinery. And then he started with a Christian newspaper. So sometimes the logistics are around us. But because our visible eyes are unable to see, we tend to think, how is that going to be possible? How is that going to be possible? God provided when Moses queried him to the point that he even provided a linguist for Chiame in the person of Aaron to speak for Moses. If we will accept that he has placed a responsibility on us, And live to that responsibility. The rest of it, it is the Lord who will do it. It will be the doing of the Lord, not our making. Begin to avail yourself to God and God's work. And let's see what will happen to your life. Many of us, we are struggling because even the little the Lord has trusted and trusted to us, we are not, we are unable to discharge it well. You, are, you may be a Sunday school teacher, but whenever it begins to rain, straight away you say to yourself that, and then begin to say, teacher's preparation will not come off. Are you getting it? Then we begin to think because sometimes we are less committed to what the Lord has given to us. You are thinking this way. I will also be in my house thinking that as a man Okay? Then you will be thinking similarly. In the end, the things of God never move as is expected. Because we have been so complacent. Because of rain. So Moses lived up to his purpose. Israel was liberated. And Israel was sent to the promised land. Aaron also was a spiritual leader. He performed the priesthood function. And he did that credibly. He was a priest. He never... <laughs> he never engaged himself and or meddled himself in the affairs of Moses. Things that were meant for Moses, Aaron allowed Moses to lead. Aaron never said that because I'm the priest of God, the high priest of course, and so and I'm, I'm more eloquent than my brother Moses and therefore uh, when Moses said yes, I will be able to convince the people and say no. Aaron never lived his life that way. He, 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 he just was on his lane as a high priest. Whenever there was any priesthood function, he lived to that expectation as a high priest. But all other things, all other political and social issues were attended by Moses. There were times when his priesthood and political, polit political social functions came together. They intersected. And so Moses' and Aaron function came together to perform. Otherwise, they both laid independently according to the responsibilities placed on them. What is your responsibility? What has been your responsibility? So, anybody who identifies his or her responsibility and live to that, you are a wise person. If you don't do that, complacency will easily set in in your life. Very soon, coming to church will be so difficult for you. 
asori kwa ye ba kwa de ene ebe ye we dey say me tena radio ho kwa me tie bi we dey me hwe tv a me and say me hwe tv a me sum tie nyame asa it because complacency has set in complacency has set in tv watching things on television is just a compliment it is not the real thing the real thing is the face to face because when we meet together you encourage me and I encourage you when I watch TV I'm unable to encourage anybody do not forget about Hebrews 10 25 we should not neglect the functioning of meeting each one another as long as the Lord gives us a fresh day we should not neglect it so what has been your function the responsibility in the house of God what is your function don't let complacency eat into your body fabric and destroy you the prophets both minor and major prophets they play certain way in fact they declare God's mind to the people they were always declaring God's mind to the people their prophetic function was is to declare the mind of God to the people. It's another uh, uh, way God declares his intention to us. As we study the word of God, we are declaring God's mind. As we prophesy, it's another way of declaring the mind of God to us. And so they all did. Isaiah and the rest, they did. Some of them even perished in the process of discharging their duty. Some of them even died in the process. But they lived to their calling. They lived. They were not complacent. They were not complacent. There was this small prophet who became complacent. And so when the Lord has sent them, said, don't eat anywhere. Go and come. Don't eat. He went and um, the Lord led him to accomplish the task. On his way going, another bigger prophet called him and said, ah, you may be very tired and hungry by this time upon all day. Can you not eat something? He said, no. He said, oh, you can eat something. And then he ate. And that was the end of his life. Because that small prophet became complacent. When the Lord has said, do not eat. And the major prophet, a bigger prophet, an older prophet comes and said, eat. And then you paid attention to the older prophet instead of God. He ate and he died. He was complacent. He played down the command of God, just as the people of Israel did. He neglected the input of God in his life in a moment. And that led to his destruction. So once upon the time in the apostles, as of apostles, they will say, we would rather listen to God rather than man. Peter and his people said that repeatedly. Beloved, let's listen to God and not man. And they were always in trouble with the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. They were always in collision with them because they want to listen to God and not man. So the prophet listening to God and they worked as the lieutenants of God. What about this? Have we been listening to ourselves? Or we have been listening to God? That is the issue. That is where complacency comes. And what happened? It comes because of that. The Lord put up a house for you. Now you have a beautiful house. Instead of rejoicing over the beauty of the house and be empowered by what the Lord has done and using that to serve the Lord we take the credit and then we keep it to ourselves and that affects our relation with God when the Lord should bless you do not use that blessing against him he is the giver so don't work against him because he has blessed your life the apostles they were the founding members of the church the new testament church peter john and the rest 
they lived their life, most of them were martyred. It means most of them were killed. Most of the apostles were killed. According to tradition, perhaps only John, John the Little, died a natural death. Even that one we are told by Revelation, he was sent to Patmos. If you have read a little bit about Patmos, you will know the kind of person. It's a wilderness. It's an island of wilderness. And Romans used to send, send their slaves, recalcitrant slaves and prisoners on that land called Patmos. They, they, it is a land filled with rock and not very much a fertile land. And so prisoners were sent there to crack stones for building projects in Rome. That was the kind of island John was sent there. But he was not killed. All of them, they were not complacent at all. The only one who was complacent was Judas Iscariot, who cherished money and betrayed his master. Not doing so were too. Being called as one of the apostles was too much for him to the point that he allowed himself to be possessed by Satan and betrayed Jesus Christ. You need not to be complacent. Don't interfere your spiritual life with complacency. It will kill your spiritual life. It will kill your spiritual life. Start from now, from first step, and by six months, your whole spiritual life will be gone. You'll be coming here, everybody will know that you came, you can sing, you can dance, but you don't have any relationship with God. But you can come to church, all right. Some of us are here, but some of us don't have any intimacy with God. Because your spiritual life is gone. Okay, so you, you will do as it will please you. You will not do the bidding of God, but you will do your own thing, your own bidding. As they please you, you do them. Your spiritual life is slowly leaving you. It is slowly leaving you. Don't forget that when we study the book of Ezekiel, I told you that from scriptures, the spirit of God left the temple. You remember that teachings? The spirit of God left the temple. Literally, the prophet Ezekiel saw the spirit of God leaving the temple eastwards and dwelled on the mountain. Instead of dwelling in the temple of God, God even preferred dwelling on the mountain. So he loved the church. He loved the temple. Meanwhile, the people were still worshiping God in the temple. It means they did a Jumayehu. Because God was not there. He was dwelling on the mountain. He didn't want to see them. He didn't want to have anything to do with them. People of God, we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. I know you know that some of us, Papa Owo Yen Wewu, Mami Owo Yen Wewu, it means it's a one day right so why the big deal why why the big deal why don't you give yourself up flexible in the hands of your maker just become flexible let your mind yes you may err but at least give the entire mind to God the entire heart to God so that everything belongs to him so, Koba said one day, Ufum Kranwa, then yet premeditated time, he just met you on the way, and then you ask God to forgive you. If you don't go about your life this way, then we are in trouble. Paul also lived to his expectation. He went to the Gentile land. He could have stayed in Israel and worked to win souls there. But then he felt that he has been called to the people of the Gentile. So he went outside Jerusalem and then preached and saved many souls there. What is your responsibility? What is the kind of responsibility the Lord has placed on you? If you will be able to work according to your calling, you are the wise person. Because if it is not your calling, it is a misplaced. 
it is a misplace and you cannot function well if drum is not really the talent the Lord has given to you you may be able to play but not reach the epitome of it so find out where your call starts and work around that otherwise complacency will set in let me add this before I sit we've heard about Ramsia Fritz Ramsia alright haven't we heard about the name Ramsia and Andrea Reese we have heard about Reese and Ramsia at least from Presbyterian church history Reese and Ramsia if you read about these two guys they came from Germany and Denland and Switzerland to administer the gospel. Ramsia, for instance, came and preferred to be in Ashanti region. So he came to Kumasi and stayed here in Kumasi. The Ashanti kingdom arrested him and the wife. Fortunately, by God's grace, he was not killed. He was not murdered. And so he was able to establish Presbyterian churches here. That's why we have Ramsia, Ramsia what? Ramsia Presbyterian here. He did a marvelous work in Ashanti region. To the extent that when he had messengers calling him over from Kweu, he also went to Kweu and established Presbyterian church, churches there. He later on died. Reese. Before Ramsia and Reese came, People that Presbyterian, um, the Basel Mission Organization in Germany, sent to Ghana. They died. Mosquito killed all of them. They brought us the second batch. Mosquito killed all of them. To the point that they, one, in one of their meetings in overseas, they almost resolved that they, uh, they were not going to send any missionary to Ghana again. You see how much people have suffered for the gospel we have now. How many of people, how many of us did not go to Presbyterian? I was a Presbyterian and I attended Presbyterian school. You too. Many of us went to, but just look at how some people, by their calling, tied themselves dangerously so that you and I will receive the message of God. When Reese came, some people were sent before he came. They died. Reese came with a group. All of them, one by one, they died. And then only Reese survived. To cut a long story short, Reese decided to go to Equiapim and affect them with the gospel. So he went there. He took a land, a parcel of land from there. He started building. That's why Reese is called Osia Dain in the history, in the annals of Presbyterian. He started building, putting on building. He started drinking himself with the natives. He started eating Engwa, snail, because he started, he, he did everything so that he could, they would identify with him. He was drinking self food with them. Sometimes I heard a story, I read the story, sometimes he would go to the, the bush to the obetrani the palm tapest hat in the in the in the bush as if he himself was obetrani in order to bring some to christ and then from him he brought at, um, people like masons and uh, blacksmith carpenters he brought white people to train the natives of Equia, Equia, Equia Pim. A crop on, on how to use saw to cut things, how to make artifacts and things like that. He brought people there to teach them. And in the end, some of them never went back. They died here. They, they died here. Just to live to their calling. They died. The people of God Reese journeyed away from Equiapi Mountains, came to Achimwebuakwa 
the only his way he founded churches there and he did all that then finally he went back home he died at the age of 50 50 years he died with all these responsibilities at 50 years he died most of them who were not killed by malaria died a natural death at a very younger age those who were not even killed by malaria went back to their home and died and that whilst their brothers and sisters who lived there lived up to 90 years 80 years and 95 years most of them died 50 years 51 years all because they sacrificed their life to the calling placed upon them what have you have you are dwelling and i dwell in complacency because of complacency even if i don't speak well this morning and I slipped by my language. I can't see him. Kitwe bi ensi enka. And who will fool? And I will be free. Because complacency is setting. Wherever there is complacency, men live cold Christian life. You become so cold. Anything small distracts you. You get angry so easily. You get disappointed so easily. Because complacency has set in. Because complacency has set in. May the Lord have mercy on us. Remember where and when you were called. Remember your first love. Go and look for your first love. And live to that. Mahuteboni. And say our life. Because in Kuntebubi, the way in him. The Lord bless us. Amen. Shall we pray? Please commit yourself to the Lord and ask the Lord to let you know your calling. Ask the Lord to know while and why you have been called into this church and not into any other church why has the Lord called you into this church and not into any other church why the Lord will show you Father I commit your children our hearts and our minds to you. Please have your own way in our lives. Open our eyes that we can see and perceive the calling place on us. By all the events in scripture, we've seen complacency, a weapon of the devil. Father, we know he uses complacency to destroy our relationship with you and our relationship with ourselves. Grant us the grace to overcome this spirit. Grant us the grace to overcome this menace. We thank you, Lord. Please let us know why we have been called as Christians and why specifically we've been called into this church let us know Lord Jesus let us know I plead with you let us know that we will not be complacent in all our dealings in Jesus mighty name Amen thank you very much Please, people of God, time has come for us to bring our tithes.